So we talked about the definition of radioactive iodine refractory disease. We talked about the role of, of radioactive iodine. Now let's talk about those patients that no longer are candidates for either a surgical approach or radioactive iodine. Marsha, when do you recommend watchful waiting? Well, I think that many times when we have a patient who has come to our attention because they've been deemed radioactive iodine refractory by an endocrinologist, there is still a, a period where we have to figure out what's happening with the disease. There, it can be a period, even after radioactive iodine stops working, where there may be either no growth whatsoever or indolent growth. And so we do a, what I would call actually not so much watchful waiting as, as sort of active surveillance, if you, if you will, because we really are looking for when to intervene. And so depending a little bit on the story, if it was a patient of Naifes who had, you know, clearly been progressing right through and we had that recent history that, that maybe they were radioactive iodine because they were progressing right through, I could say, oh, okay, I need to intervene now because I have that history, it's growing. But I'll tell you probably at least half of the time, I get somebody who had radioactive iodine 10 years before, and I have no idea. And now they have newly diagnosed metastasis in their lungs. Maybe they had a car accident and a chest x-ray suddenly discovered this. I have no idea, has that been there for 10 years? Or has it, is it newly growing? And so in the beginning, in the, our, our, just our rule of thumb is the first year, we'll do a CAT scan every three months. If they're, not, if they're not growing after that year, we start to liberalize that. It gets to every six months or even once a year. Um, and that's really because I, I have to understand. And I, I guess the important point I'd also say with that is that it's at, since the oncologist needs to know what the rate of progression is of the disease, I think it's important to start involving them as soon as you think there's radioactive iodine is no longer taking it up. Because the oncologists, I do think, need to understand the nature of the disease. If we only get the patients when they're already in trouble, sometimes that's a little bit too late. So active surveillance, as soon as we know that they're radioactive iodine, and then we can liberalize it. It, it, it really is active surveillance. That's mm -hmm. a great term. Thanks, Marcia. Let's talk about the, the flip side of that, if you will. Manisha, who are the patients that are good candidates for therapy? So for systemic therapy, such as tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, the candidates that are appropriate would be patients who have progressive disease, have bulky disease, uh, their site of metastasis is in a risky place. So for example, if they have uh, disease around the bronchus uh, where they are prone to have hemoptysis or some consequences where cancer is affecting their quality of life or that it's danger of, of life. So, uh, so for example, bony metastasis that's about to have spinal cord compression and so forth, so. So the location of the disease, the pace of the disease, yes. uh, the, the volume of the disease, and symptoms. Yes. Okay, all right. Um, Naifa, which patient subtypes are most likely to progress after radioactive iodine? Yeah, so um, this, that's actually a fairly timely question. There are certain histologic subtypes that we think of, uh, about as more advanced or more, uh, less well differentiated. So um, sclerosing variant of papillary, um, insular, herthal cell, um, and poorly differentiated uh, thyroid cancers are the ones that probably are um, less likely to be radioactive iodine um, avid and more likely to progress. But beyond the histologic subtypes, we're also learning more about molecular subtypes within um, differentiated thyroid cancer. So um, the, although not all BRAF mutant uh, thyroid cancers, uh, papillary thyroid cancers are radioactive iodine non-avid, we see that more of the BRAF mutant uh, different, uh, papillary thyroid cancers are radioactive iodine non-avid or resistant. Um, and we're learning more about various uh, subtypes within it. So, for example, if they have PI3 kinase mutations and various other mutations, we're learning that those are less likely to take up radioactive iodine as well, although there more needs, work needs to be done there. So really there are some factors that can uh, predict a worse prognosis. Um, let me just follow up on that for just a minute. Um, do you test all your patients for BRAF mutation? So um, at, we do not test all our patients for BRF mutations. Um, we are doing more and more molecular profiling of our differentiated thyroid cancers. Um, but somebody who's low risk, uh, for example, a young uh, lady who has um, a small tumor and maybe only central lymph nodes involved, doing a BRAF mutation will not change my management. So I'd still go down the same pathway. So we're not doing all tumors, but those who we feel are high risk um, and or more uh, involved disease. That makes sense. I'd like to make a comment actually about that. 
so what's really amazing is we're sort of at the, at the beginning of where these molecular markers are going to play a role. And what's amazing is we know a lot of information. It can use, in, in the endocrine world, it's very important for prognosticating and also for them to know maybe where the surveillance goes. And it's yet at the same time, we're still at a point where we don't have any approved drugs, for instance, that actually depend on these markers. It's a very active area of research because now we have certain drugs that can directly target them. But what's interesting is that even though we will be doing these markers, it's still at this point the criteria for starting our systemic therapy. So, so the two worlds, endocrinology, it's still a very prevalent, important question. Still in the systemic world, we're, we're not really using it to discriminate at this point any at time with, with therapies, maybe some new ones coming down. Yeah, a lot of promise in the future. Yeah, and, but and not, of course, not there yet. And we'll talk a lot about that uh, coming up. Um, Gary.